Okay, we'll continue on. So, well, first of all, did anybody come up with any questions before I start? Um, I, it's less of a question and more of just a thought I had. But okay. um, so we're we're kind of talking about the uh, somatic mosaic mosaicism uh, in terms of like increasing cancer risk, right? Yes. But uh, couldn't the opposite also be true? So if if you inherited deleterious mutations from a parent and you experience a somatic mutation that um, was actually beneficial and would help prevent you from getting cancer, could that not also occur? It could. It could. Um, and in fact, well, generally speaking, it's hard to, it, it could happen. Most mutations are probably not beneficial, but probably some could be. Um, for example, you could get a mutation which enhanced the efficacy of DNA repair, and that would reduce your general mutation, somatic mutation rate. And that would probably have a significant effect on your probability of developing cancer, for example. And um, there, I'm sure it could be other examples. So it probably, it, I'm sure it happens. Yeah. The thing in biology is that usually the answer of, to the question of does X exist the answer is almost always, the answer is often yes for anything that's not outrageous. But you know, the, I think the bigger the question we tend to want to ask is what's you know what's the range of outcomes, and and that's related to the sort of next point I want to discuss, which is you know most mutations are probably most mutations may have no effect, which may actually be the more common situation or very weak effect. Um, so that's one of the interesting issues, but, and so in fact, as I emphasized right at the start, one of the strongest predictions of the whole concept is that there'll be a lot of variation between individuals in the degree of mosaicism because mutations that happen early in development cause a high level of mosaicism, but those are the most stochastic because there you have the smallest number of cells, right? When you only have a few cells, then the probability of mutation is, is really quite a you know, chance event. Once you get a lot of cells, the probability of mutation is pretty high. Right? If you have a million cells and the probability of mutation per cell division is one in a million, then in the next round of cell division, you're probably going to have one mutation. And the variance around that's not going to be that high. But yeah. so. So then I think one of the real challenges is, is really what's the fraction of cells that carry a mutation in individual bodies. And we don't have a real good sense of that. Although, as I said, I'll give you a study in a couple minutes that's our best current estimate for that, for that information. But I think to me, the real, the real question is what's the variability between individuals and in the degree of mosaicism with respect to mutations that could cause disease? Because that really gets us to the perhaps most important question, which is what's the, what's the fraction of adult onset disease risk which arises from this process? You know, is because we're typically talking about adult onset disease. Most cancers happen in adulthood. Most neurodegenerative diseases and other age-related diseases are diseases of adulthood. And the question would be, what fraction of those of the risk for those late onset diseases is really set early in life by this mosaic process? We know that inherited mutations can be very important. So in principle, these somatic mosaicisms could be very important. And because we've emphasized that variability is the strongest prediction of the process, then the conceptually, the theory says that variability in individual risk should be very high as a consequence of mosaicism. So a lot of the variability between individuals and the probability of developing disease later in life 
may actually be a consequence of this mosaic process. Now, we don't know that in terms of the data available. But I, to me, the theory says that that's not, it would not be a surprising outcome. And as I emphasize, this is a subject which is really a real-time subject because people are now tuned into the problem. Technically, it's very challenging because to get data on the variation of mosaicism between individuals, you've got to sequence a lot of individuals. And now sequencing here is much harder because we're not talking about sequencing an individual once, like 23andMe. We're talking about sequencing a large number of cells from each individual sampled across their tissues. Now, getting samples from individuals from their different tissues is no easy thing. Probably the easiest way to do it is to do it on autopsy because, um, you know, you can't just have somebody come in and say, okay, I want a piece of your kidney, I want some liver, a little bit of your brain would be good. You know, it's not, it's not a typical sampling thing. Sign here, you know, for your disclosure form. Um, so it's challenging to get the data and, and, and it takes a lot of work. But on the other hand, the interest is really developing in this. And every year I follow the subject and every year you can see the interest rising as people getting better and better data and they're starting to put more and more effort into this. So, um, so I think it's kind of a, a nice subject. And I really, another thing I really like about the subject is I think it really kind of changes your view of bodies because now you start to think, at least I do, I think of bodies in terms of cell lineages and the geometry of your different tissues. Earlier, somebody asked a question that was almost like this question, but it wasn't quite, but I like to ask this, which is, um, does your liver develop from one cell or is it, as an evolutionary biologist would say, is it polyphyletic? Polyphyletic means that there were multiple cells, lineages that came together and coalesced to form the tissue, as opposed to the entire tissue tracing back to a single ancestral cell. Okay. And so that's interesting because, I mean, it sort of asks a fundamental question about development and how your body develops. And people are also taking up this notion of tracing cell lineages, which is closely related to the problems we've talked about. So we're starting to see now people becoming very interested in lineage history. In fact, there was an article in Science sometime in the last three weeks that was about cell lineage history and what that can teach us. And um, I like to use the phrase somatic evolutionary genomics. Remember I told you that your body has more evolutionary history than the history of all the primates that have ever lived. So we're talking just about a, and, you know, historically it wasn't that people didn't really know that, but it was just so hard empirically to think that way that people just didn't think that way and it just sort of disappeared. So this is something that technology is really bringing on. And I think it's really a, a fascinating thing that connects a lot of different subjects together. <clears throat> So we've been talking, we've sort of been talking mostly about cancer implicitly, but now I want to talk a little bit about other diseases. And so we'll turn to neurodegeneration next. And if you read the OneNote file, I told this little story, but I'll repeat it now, which is about 12 or 13 years ago. I have a good friend who works on neurodegenerative diseases. She's a, a, a very good scientist and she I was interested in cancer at the time and had no, in, no, no studies of neurodegenerative diseases I was working on. And she asked me if the kinds of work I was doing in cancer research, where I was looking at the relation between genes and age of onset and mosaicism and all these sorts of things, could that be applied to neurodegeneration? Because she said, in neuro, and people who study neurodegeneration just don't think that way at all. And she was wondering if it would be possible to connect genetics and age of onset, epidemiology, and all these other things together and apply those ideas to neurodegeneration. And my first answer just immediately was no, that's, that, that's not gonna work because cancer and neurodegeneration are so different. Cancer develops by a few cells in your body getting some mutations, some physiological changes, their environment changes, but you got just a tiny little piece of tissue. And then those cells become abnormal and they start to divide very fast and spread throughout the body. So I like to think of that as local origin followed by global disease. But the local origin is crucial for the whole 
for everything that we think about in terms of the dynamics of cancer and how it develops. And that neurodegeneration isn't like that. I mean, your, you know, your brain seems to undergo some sort of deterioration that's systemic and it's not a, and so I said, well, I don't, I just don't think that's going to work. And then I went home and I thought about it and I said to myself, you don't know that. <laughs> Do you know that to myself? And the answer is no, I don't know that. I mean, how does neurodegeneration start? I have no idea. And so I started looking in the literature thinking, well, I'll just, you know, it's a huge subject, right? The literature on neurodegeneration is immense. And so I started reading about it, thinking, well, I'll just, I'll just read in the literature about how neurodegeneration starts and I'll find out. And the strange thing was that almost, there, was almost no, there was almost no discussion of how the disease actually starts mechanistically. I could not find an answer to whether the disease tended to start in a small piece of tissue and spread, but I couldn't even find discussion about whether that would, about that at all. People studied neurodegeneration and it was just like this black box about how it started mechanistically. You know, we studied these people and they got neurodegeneration. We worked on this mouse model and we changed its genes and it got Parkinson's disease. Now, there were a few people that were thinking about it, and you know, we're not going to go over the history in detail. People who studied prions, for example, were interested in the origin and spread. But for the most part, this was really a real backwater. And in those days, most people thought the prion people were nuts. I mean, they, people understood that prions existed, but if you don't know what prions are, don't worry about it, but we won't really talk about it. But anyway, um, And so then I realized that, well, if it's quite possible, there's no reason why neurodegeneration might not start in a small piece of tissue and spread. There's a lot of evidence that genetic mutations can be important for the origin of neurodegeneration. And there's a lot of evidence that in some diseases, neurodegenerative diseases, there's, there seems to be local problems first and then the problems spread. And there were few people, just a very few people who were discussing that. And so I thought, well, okay, if if neurogeneration does start locally and spread, then somatic mosaicism could be very important. Because if you've got a mosaic piece of tissue with mutations in a small piece of your brain, and those, that piece of tissue gets transformed into a diseased focus, and then the disease spreads from that location like a cancer does, then somatic mosaicism could be a primary risk factor for neurodegeneration. So I was writing an article about somatic mosaicism. This is about 2009 or 10. And I decided to include a brief discussion of this neurodegeneration idea. And it was an invited article. So invited articles, usually they're going to get accepted, but they still get reviewed. And so it got sent out for review. And the, one of the reviewers was furious that I included this in the article because the editor sent it to a person who knew about neurodegenerative disease, was an expert in neurodegeneration. And the person was furious that I dared to say this because it was, they thought it was the stupidest thing they'd ever heard of. Um, now, I'm, not, I'm telling you partly it's a personal story, but, but mostly I'm telling you to you because this is typical. This wasn't that long ago, it was 10 years, that the view by the expert neuroscientist who the article was sent to was that this was so ridiculous that it could not, be, it could not even be published. It couldn't even be published as maybe this is going on because it was just totally poor science and you know we can't have this in a good journal. The editor let it in, but um, I had to write in you know all these qualifications like, of course we don't know, and you know this could be, you throw in all those words, but it doesn't mean anything. Um, and anyway, this, the issue of, neuro, of, of somatic mosaics and the neurodegeneration is now um, rapidly developing into a huge topic. And so this article I've been promising you that was published three weeks ago. I want to I want to read to you the abstract because it's um, it's it's both the best study on mosaicism in general. Plus, it also ties into this question of neurodegeneration. I think it's really um, it really shows what's going on, and I think it's, I, I find it very interesting. As you can tell I'm fascinated by the topic, so we'll give it a go. So this is the reference, Nature Neuroscience, and it was just came online a few weeks ago, and I think it's in the OneNote file. 
So here's the abstract. I'm just going to read the abstract, and we'll, you know, we'll sort of read it together. We characterize the landscape of somatic mutations, mutations occurring after fertilization in the human brain using ultra deep 250 coverage, whole genome sequencing of prefrontal cortex from 50, 59 donors with autism spectrum disorder and 15 controls. Okay, so they've got, now that sample size doesn't sound huge, but this is an immense amount of work because as you say, they're looking at huge numbers of cells from and doing the genomics on huge numbers of cells from each of these individuals. We observe a mean of 26 somatic single nucleotide variants per brain present in more than 4% of cells. So these are not just the number of mutations that they found, but these are mutations that are found in more than 4% of the cells with enrichment of mutations in coding and regulatory regions, meaning that these mutations have a consequence. Our analysis reveals that the first cell division after fertilization produces about three mutations. So in that first zygotic division, going back to Jamie's picture, the expectation in the whole genome is that there's about three mutations happening in that first zygotic division, which means that about half of the body is going to contain three mutations that arose in that first zygotic division, and that every cell division after that is introducing another two to three mutations in each cell generation. So now you have to visualize that branching process in early, in early um, development with two to three mutations happening in every cell division being carried forward to all descendant cells and thinking about how widely mosaic an individual body is then, right? Because these are in the very, you know, really every generation, even the later cellular generations, which still count for a large number of cells. I like to say that a you know, mutation that happens, you know, later may lead to a small fraction of cells being mutated, but since you have 10, 100 trillion cells, a small fraction of mutated cells can still be a huge number of cells, right? You know, one 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 thousandth of a hundred million is still a hundred billion. So this suggests that a typical individual possesses about 80, 80 somatic single nucleotide variants that are present in more than 2% of cells, comparable to the number of germline mutations that get introduced into the germline in every generation, with about half of individuals having at least one potentially function-altering somatic mutation somewhere in this particular part of the brain. Now, I want to emphasize that, let me get my tools here. So this is single nucleotide variant. Now, it's already known from other studies that a lot of the Genetic mosaicism in the brain is actually copy number variants. These are duplications of genes where the, the number of copies of a gene varies between cells. And so this is, yeah, uh, go ahead. How, can, um, how can there be copy number variants if there is no like recombination during um, mitosis? I don't know. I don't know what the mechanism is, but there's, um, in the literature, there's um, significant discussion of copy number variants as being widespread in the brain. Um, uh, I mean, there can be there can be chromosomal interactions. There's not meiotic recombination, but mitotic chromosomes do undergo a variety of potential rearrangements and interactions. They're just not exactly like meiotic ones. But I don't know uh, the exact. But you can look that up. I, I mean, I just don't know the answer. Okay, thanks. And um, also, there can be, of course epigenetic mutations. So these are just single nucleotide variants. But actually, I think on the whole, people think that other types of variations are probably even more prevalent than single nucleotide. The copy number variants seem to happen at a higher rate than the single nucleotide variants. So this gives you a notion of how incredibly mosaic your brain is and the rest of your body. Again, this is um, really the one of the best detailed studies with numerics on this process. Aut the ASD is autism spectrum disorder brain showing excess of somatic mutations and neural enhancer sequences compared to with controls, suggesting that mosaic enhancer mutations may contribute to autism spectrum disorder risk. In other words, there's a correlation between these 
somatic mutations and the actual manifestation of clinical um, condition, showing that mosaicism may actually be a significant contributor to this particular disease. Okay. So, right. So I'll stop there for questions. So Steve, if I understand that correctly, then is is this suggesting that there might be an an additional layer of heritability to diseases based upon like mosaicism enhancer genes? I think you're moving in the right direction, but it's it's so weird that it's hard to get the words right. What I like to think of and this goes back to when I was discussed with Jessica about clinical um, genetics. I think the thing, if, if you can do the following, get a picture in your mind of cell lineage history and think of the zygote, okay? There's the zygote. Anything, any mutation that happens before the zygote is inherited, right, in the history, because the zygote will carry that mutation because it happened before the zygote. And then all cells of the body have that, and that's an inherited mutation. Now imagine above the zygote, any, and that's what we're calling somatic now, any mutation that happens above the zygote is in some of the cells and not others. And it's a continuum. That goes back to Micah's question about the Luria-Delbrick process, that it's really a continuous process. And the closer to the zygote it happens the more of your cells carry it and the more it's like an inherited mutation. But whether you transmit it to your progeny depends on whether the mutation is in the cell lineage that goes to your germline. So remember I asked the question about whether a tissue was derived from a single cell, monophyletic, we say in evolution, or whether a, a tissue has multiple cellular inputs. That's a very important question because if you get a mutation in a cell lineage that goes to your brain, is it also possible that that cell lineage branches off and goes to your germline so that you might have the mutation in your brain and in your sperm or eggs, but maybe not in your blood? So when you go to the clinic, people say, well, you don't have this mutation. So the fact that you have the clinical manifestation of inherited disease it's just weird. We don't under, we, you know, we don't understand it. But I've asked people who study, for example, leukemia, do you ever get people who come to the clinic and they look like they have inherited disease because you get certain clinical manifestations of inherited diseases that are quite clear. And yet when you look at them genetically, you say, well, that, but they don't have the inherited mutation. They say, yeah, we see that. So if you get in your mind the point at which the mutation happens in relation to the zygote, and you can keep that in your mind, then you can answer all the questions that you have, and you can think about it. And as I've emphasized, one of the real great reasons for studying this topic is that if it gets you thinking that way, you're thinking about organisms and genetics and disease and biology, I think in a way that's a real advance in, in, in your intuition about biology um, and bodies and problems, especially if you think about cancer and neurodegeneration, a lot of the diseases that we deal with, we know there's a genetic component. We know that a lot of people who get the diseases don't seem to have an inherited mutation. Well, guess what? <laughs> you know, now we know that a huge fraction of those people that don't have an inherited mutation probably have a somatic mutation which allows them to carry that mutation in a significant fraction of their cells. So the real question that we need to answer is, what's the relation between the fraction of your cells that carry a mutation and the probability of getting disease? For cancer, we know that a small number of mutated cells can lead to disease because we understand the process. A few cells get transformed to a tumor and it spreads throughout your body. 
for neurodegeneration, we're kind of in between now. We're sort of in a transition in the history of the studies of neurodegeneration. Ten years ago, somebody could say about the idea that, that I suggested, um, that it was such a stupid idea that it should not be allowed into a good journal, not even allowed as an idea into a journal. So now where it's being proposed as potentially significant. Now notice that the person here is implicitly emphasizing that a mutation that's in 4% of your cells is sufficient to cause potentially a disease. Now autism spectrum disorder is not like neurodegeneration. It's every disease is different. And so the interesting question, and this forces you to think about a good biological problem, is how does a disease actually start mechanistically in relation to cell biology? So this way of looking at the body forces you to think about that question. And you would think that that would be a standard question that people would always ask, but it's not so. It's happening more and more, but it isn't really so. And partly because it's a hard question to answer. So let's follow that with um, the question of what other diseases might be influenced by this process. Because I've just been emphasizing that diseases that are inherent, that are influenced by genetic mutations, but diseases that can start from a small focus of tissue, so that if a small number, a small piece of tissue carries the mutation, that could be sufficient to cause the disease. What other disease might be like that that's a common disease? This is your qualifying exam question for your bio, for you biologists. Well, heart disease is complicated because heart disease is caused by many things. But a certain fraction of heart disease arises from what are called arteriosclerotic plaques. You know, we think of this as your blood vessels getting gummed up, right? And you know that they can lead to stroke or, or heart disease from blood clots forming in your blood vessels. But actually, our arteriosclerotic plaques are kind of interesting. They, they form, first of all, it's known that genetics can influence a predisposition to forming plaques. And the plaques are actually, um, they have a progression, almost like a tumor. They have early stages where there becomes a little bit of a, a bump in the blood vessel when you get a set of endothelial cells. These are the normal cells of the blood vessel. You get some immune cells. And you get a combination of cells that start to form a, an inappropriate abnormal environment that begins to attract other cells. You get some inflammation in particular. You start to attract other cells. And this little bump in the blood vessel starts to grow and becomes abnormal. And then you start to get some immune cells that start to secrete various things and it forms a big bump, and then eventually it turns into a, you get some foamy stuff that comes out, and you get some fatty tissue that gets associated with it, and then you might get a blood clot associated with it, and that's how disease develops. Now, it's known that there's genetic predisposition to plaque formation. Some people have even suggested that somatic mutations could be important, and that means that somatic mosaicism could be a major risk factor, and just in the last year or two, I've started to see some articles where people are starting to talk about it. Again, it's, these are hard things to study empirically. Think about what you have to do in order to get evidence that somatic mosaicism is playing a key role in plaque formation. <laughs> You've got to get bodies and, and study the degree of mosaicism and study the location of plaques in relation to mosaicism. And, you know, it's basically you have to, you have to, um, you can't do it on a living person. You have to do it with an autopsy, or you have to do it in a lab model. So it's, it's hard work. But people are starting to recognize that it's important, and so I think people are really tuning into it. And so again, we're going to see this coming up. Now, these things take time because the work is so hard. But I'm, again, I'm seeing more and more of this in the literature. Um, so I think heart disease is probably one of the really interesting things. Um, then there's a, a few other biological problems that once you start to think this way become interesting. One I like to think of is, I like to think of infections in individuals. So think about somebody who's doing a lab experiment on malaria 
I have a friend who does this. He, he studies mice, and they have uh, malaria, malarial species that infect mice. They use it as a model to study human malaria. And then they can look at different drugs and the evolution of drug resistance. So they have a bunch of mice. They inoculate the mice with these plasmodium, which is the parasite that causes malaria. And then the plasmodium grow up into a big population inside each mouse, which is what happens with an infection. And then they can treat the mice with drugs. And I pointed out to him that this is a Luria-Delbruck process because you're starting each mouse with a genetic clone and you do it with a genotype of the, of the pathogen, the parasite that you know because you're studying this in a controlled manner. But by the time that plasmodium has grown up into a big population within the mouse, you've acquired some somatic mutations causing the population of parasites as a soma in this case, right? And that the frequency of mutations is going to vary a lot between the mice because that's exactly what happens in this process. So you're thinking that you've got genetically controlled mice. You bought them from a laboratory and they, you, know, you know exactly what the genotype is. And you're thinking you have genetically controlled parasites because you grew them up with no genotype and you put them into each body. But by the time you're treating them with drugs, you've got a huge amount of genetic variation in the plasmodium from mouse to mouse. And a lot of the variation in the results that you're going to see from your experiment are coming from the genetic variation between the mice through this luria delbert process. Now, once you think about it that way, you recognize that every pathogen population within a host and every bacterial population that's growing up, starting from a small number of cells and growing up into a big population, is having the same process of accumulation of mutations and variation between populations. And remember that the single strongest prediction of this process is high variation between populations. And so, again, you start to think about this and you'll see a lot of experiments that are done and a lot of observations. You'll be able to connect up to this process because it's such a fundamental process of the way organisms grow and develop. So, again, I like to think of this as a solution in search of a puzzle. But I, I think that it's a solution that's going to find a lot of puzzles. Um, and uh, something that really, for me, changed the way I, I view a lot of different problems in biology. So, so we have just a couple minutes, so we'll take time to answer any questions that may have come up. I, I have something I can throw in as well. Uh, something that came to mind to me, right, because we're talking about essentially having different populations of cells, right, um, that I can imagine that this could come into play with autoimmune disorders because of the fact that, you know, you're possessing these multiple populations of cells within an individual. That's actually a really good point. And um, Jonathan, the other Jonathan, is a, often asked questions about autoimmunity, and I never thought to bring that up. But um, that's a very interesting idea, and I've never seen that connection made. And so... Um, if you're really curious about it, I recommend that you look into it. I'd be happy to talk to you a bit more about it because the interest in mosaicism is really growing. So it's a very timely thing. And if you can figure out a way to make a connection um, by finding anything in the literature that might connect up, it might make a nice little, you know, little study or a little article. Um, it's a very good idea. And once you say, as soon as you said it, you know, it's like, yeah. I see where you're going. Um, but as long as I've worked on this, I've never thought of that before. So that's really good. So, yeah, I follow up on it and see what you can find. Maybe the other Jonathan, who reads a lot about autoimmunities, got some pointers for you about where to start. I'd be done. Um, I have a couple uh, questions. Let's see. I guess one, I was, I just picked the first one that comes to mind. It's like, would looking at what studying variation in mosaicism 
I guess to what extent does studying that question uh, l uh, lend itself to, I guess, to what extent does that problem relate to the, I guess, the topic of evolvability? Um, well, it could have some effect on, if you imagine a single genotype actually having different somatic realizations, then the ability of a genotype to survive a radical change in the environment may actually depend on the degree to which that genotype can produce a range of somas. The broader the range of somas, that it's a bit like plasticity, but of a sort of random sort. The broader the range of phenotypes that you can produce for a given genotype, the better you can deal with a novel challenge. And the better a genotype can deal with a novel challenge, the more likely it is to survive and eventually genetically evolve to, to deal with the challenge. So the first challenge of evolving in response to a novel challenge is to survive. Because if you don't survive, you're out of the game. So one of the, one of the key aspects of evolvability is the survivability of a genotype in relation to challenge. And one could imagine that somatic mosaicism influences survivability. For example, a genotype which produces a, more, a, a wider set of somatic realizations will have a greater probability of surviving an environmental challenge and therefore has a greater probability of eventually evolving in response to that challenge by a rather inverse process. The genotype doesn't carry heritable mutations, but it has a higher probability of surviving the challenge to eventually accumulate the new mutations that it needs to adapt to the change. If you understand all that, it's a little bit of a it reminds me of the Baldwin effect. Exactly, that's what, I'm, that's what I'm mimicking in the logic. It's a Baldwin-like analogy that um, seems to me to be plausible. Yeah. So that would be a potential benefit of for organisms that live in highly variable environment and challenging environments that could be advantageous. And you can actually think about it in terms of bacteria too, because you can think of a bacterial population that starts with a single individual and then produces a population. And you can think about the soma as the population then. So you can think about the ability of a bacterial genotype to compensate or deal with novel challenge also in the same light. It's 11.50, so if you have to go, feel free to go. Um, actually, I have to go in a minute because I have another meeting in just a couple minutes. So, um, I just have, I guess, then a quick question just about okay. going all the way back to the, like how this is, uh, I guess, going back to the idea that like this was the Deloria Dobrik uh, process is kind of like a, a solution looking for a problem. I guess, like, um, to what extent, uh, I guess, would it be, I guess, in your opinion, would it be, do you think it'd be in a sort of accurate portrayal of like the core of like mathematical modeling that like, you know, we're, it's sort of like we have this physical, we have these sort of, it's almost like, it, now that I say it, it sort of reminds me of the discussion of like, you need to, t need to straddle the balance between bi physical and biological and physical constraints and biological adaptive uh, uh, processes. But I guess the, Thing I just want to ask is if how accurate the, uh, this reverse reverse and this reverse direction uh, approach of puzzles uh, reflects or reflects the core of mathematical modeling. Um, you know, there's what you're saying makes sense. Although I don't think of it, in this case, it's not really a. In this case, it's a biological idea about the logic of cell lineages. Right. You can call that mathematical, in some sense it is, but it's a particular insight about the nature of biology that comes, that arises from pure logic. And then we look for the biological implications of that logical conclusion. And um, 
I've seen several cases where that happens, and then some, you know, a lot of times you work in the other direction. I think the key is that you basically, to be a good theoretical biologist, that you can go, that you're open to going in whatever direction comes up and you're lucky enough to hit on, because in your lifetime, you only really come across a few good ideas. And if they come to you first as logical ideas, then that's great. And if they come to you first through the study of empirical puzzles, that's great. And if you want to be good, you need to be looking at both sides because you need to be finding as many of these as possible. So I'm sort of a, a you know, universalist when it comes to technique. I think you, you're as good as, as the number of different technical approaches that you can master and bring to bear on the problem you're studying in biology. Biology is uh, particularly challenging and multifaceted and any particular approach is often very limited in its scope. But if you have a lot of different approaches, then you can often you know, do quite well. So that's my personal view on that.